Okay, so we are now recording. We have chat open. Everyone is muted upon entry. If you have questions or have audio difficulties, please let me know in the chat and go ahead and send the chats to everyone so CCS staff can also see. We are here for our second quarterly migration update. Um, we had our first in January and that recording is up on our migration portal. And we'll have this one today, another in February, and we'll have one more in March. Just a quick overview of where we are in our timeline. The last time we spoke uh, in a webinar format like this, we were in July and we were just about to start the test data extraction. So we've come a long way since then. It's been several months and we're now firmly in our training, testing, and configuration phase of our project. And that's what we're going to focus most of our conversation on today. So we'll have this brief introduction, and then we're going to talk about training, data testing, and configuration. And for each of those, we'll talk a little bit about what's already been done, as well as what's left to do. We'll then look at what's coming ahead over the next several months as we prepare for Go Live. Again, if you have any questions, please let us know in the chat. So we're going to start with training. And I think the first and most important thing to reiterate is that we are looking at a train the trainer model. And what is train the trainer? In a train the trainer model, subject experts, um, in this case, Polaris or CCS staff, train a select group of staff who then go back and disseminate that information. So we have Polaris and CCS as our subject experts. We have in each library a set of library trainers, and then those trainers are going to train the rest of the library staff. And today we're going to talk about some of the training that's already happened, as well as resources that are available as you continue your training back in your libraries and what some of those expectations are. I want to first talk about the Polaris and CCS-led trainings. So those are both underway, although we, at this point we have had more Polaris training than CCS training. For these trainings, those key library staff and in-house trainers have registered in advance to attend. And for almost all of the sessions, that registration um, has been open and is mostly complete, although we'll be adding a couple of sessions coming up that you'll hear more about and hear more registration information on. These training sessions are intended to serve as a foundation for the training that you're going to need long term to be successful with Polaris. The Polaris trainings, the ones led by Polaris staff, innovative staff, focus mostly on software functionality. Um, while the Polaris trainers are aware of what some of our local policies and practices are. They're trying to incorporate that into their training, but they are experts in the software itself rather than CCS procedures okay. or practices. Um, for all of those trainings, we have agendas and slides that are already available on the migration portal. Those are available for everyone to use. We've had a few questions at some, some recent trainings about like, oh, can I share that with everyone in my library? Anything that's on the portal is available for you to use in your training and share. And we'll talk more about what some of those resources are in just a few minutes. CCS-led training, the first sessions of which happened just this month, will incorporate more local practices and policies. So those are being produced as we learn. As we talked about in the last webinar and um, at just about every opportunity that I have, I do like to remind library staff that CCS staff are learning along with you all. So um, we've had some questions about when is certain documentation coming out or do you have agendas or material ready for your training that we can use with our staff? And um, in most cases, the answer to that is that we're working on it because we're continuing to better understand the like how the software works and how to incorporate that into our training. So that is why our training agendas are not yet available is because we're still building them. 
So as we get closer to the dates of those actual trainings, those will be available to you on the portal, as will any additional materials like handouts, slides, videos, anything else that we use. So watch for those coming soon. The Polaris and CCS-led training, as I said, should serve as a foundation for all of the training that will happen over the course of the project. And a lot of that training is going to be in library training. In the Train the Trainer model, again, the, small, the smaller group of staff are trained kind of centrally, and then most of the training happens at the library level. And that is for a few different reasons. Um, first and foremost, we have space and time issues. Uh, it would be great if CCS staff could train everyone in your libraries because we would love to meet you all and work with you, but we are limited in the amount of resources we have. Uh, Hands-on training is by far the most effective way to learn this kind of software, so when we're looking at hands-on training, we're immediately looking at a smaller group. So if we're training about like 15 people at a time, it would take us a very long time to train all the staff at all of the libraries. So that's our first issue. Um, the second reason that we're not able to train everyone is that there are a lot of procedures in libraries that we just don't know about. The in-library training is developed by your local library staff because you know your local workflows and practices better than we do. And that's going to be an important element of the training. That said, we do want to support you in every way possible as you're working on your in-house training. So we have a lot of CCS created resources that will be available to use and we will continue to be creating and adding to those and building them as the months go on. Some of the ways that libraries differ um, is in departmental makeup and division of duties. So we've had a lot of questions about um, how many training sessions do I need to have or who should be trained by which library staff and that's really going to differ at each of your libraries. Um, I worked at one reference uh, desk as, as a librarian where I was not able to edit any patron records with any information at all. And I worked at another library where we were happy to update patron phone numbers and email addresses, but of course not address information at the reference desk. So in those two scenarios, um, in one I would have needed to know how to edit patron records, and in another, that was not a permission that I was going to have and wouldn't need to be trained on. So that departmental makeup and division of duties should be reflected in your in-library training, which is why the training at one library, the number of sessions or the kinds of sessions could look very different from the training at another library within CCS. A key element of the in-library training is that it is ongoing. Later, we'll talk about some um, training deadlines but what's important to note is that whether you attend a CCS or Polaris-led training or an in-library training session, this is not a one-and-done scenario. Um, while you can get a lot of information in these training sessions, and we're doing everything we can to make them robust and detailed and help you uh, move forward with your day-to-day -day practices, there's a lot to be said for just sort of the repetition and building that muscle memory that when you open the software, it's not surprising to you anymore um, and that you've really had a chance to explore and get to know it. So making time um, either for yourself or if you're a manager, um, making that time for your staff to participate in more than one kind of training activity and do so on an ongoing basis is going to be important. And we'll talk about data testing and how that too can feed into uh, the learning process as well as the important error finding process. So in-library training is developed by local library staff but supported by CCS with um, our central resources. It's reflective of your local workflows and your practices and it's continuous. What are some of these resources that we have available to you? Um, there's lots of information currently available on the portal and we're continuing to build it. One very popular tool that we've been highlighting in our weekly newsletter and have brought all together on the portal are our two-minute tutorials. Um, and some eagle eyes have pointed out that these are longer than two minutes, but we're trying to keep them under 
under three wherever possible. So they're quick snippets that you can dive right into and get a sense of how to use a major function in Leap. These are available to you to copy, to share, to embed. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, what we're creating, we're creating for you to use. Each of these videos also includes a handout with screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions. And these are the kinds of materials that we'll be putting together into a procedure manual. But as we go, we're making them available to you for your immediate use. So you can do lots of different things with these. You can put them on your staff intranet and just make them available. You can incorporate them into staff meetings. You can have library staff do certain exercises. But these are, are built and ready for you, and we're going to continue to add to these. Some other resources that are already on the portal I briefly mentioned already, we have training agendas and slides. So all of the agendas that Polaris has provided to us for their trainings are already up and posted. We've also shared all of their slides. While the training that they're presenting is hands-on and mostly consists of live demo, the slides do a nice job of walking through those steps with screenshots. So you can um, use these as a basis for your own training. Um, or otherwise uh, share them with your library staff. We've also posted the webinar recordings for the webinars that we've had so far with Polaris. Um, it does take a little bit of time to get them turned around from Polaris to us. So you'll see um, maybe some of them posted, but not all of them. For example, I do not believe we received the interlibrary loan webinar recording yet but you will be able to find uh, the Power Pack recording, a Simply, Repo Simply Reports recording, and you can watch those at any time. Again, either share them in their entirety with your staff or if you want to break out um, smaller pieces of information to share, those are resources that are available. At our Train the Trainer sessions earlier this month, Deborah also shared um, some sample in-house training agendas, which will be on the portal by the end of the day today if they are not already. Um, and then we're going to continue to build, as I said, the CCS agendas and slides and additional webinar recordings. So we've seen a lot of traffic on the portal, and I would encourage you to keep coming back and visiting. As we send out those weekly newsletters, we, all, we are highlighting new content. So we don't expect you to go through and like search the portal for anything that may not have been there the last time you looked. We're trying to highlight that in our weekly newsletter. But uh, do, do check back occasionally um, or pass, click through those newsletters back to the portal. And then our data testing worksheets can also be a helpful training tool. These are available on the portal um, for almost all of these categories at this time. And we'll talk more about how to use them for data testing in a few minutes but they kind of walk through each element of each kind of record and indicate how it may compare to Symfony. So as someone who, if someone wants to kind of better understand an item record, they can certainly watch the two-minute tutorial that we have available, or they can take a look at this worksheet and kind of walk themselves step-by-step -step through looking at an item record. So there's lots of different ways that staff can be exploring the database even before they may have a formal group training session. As far as when those training sessions might happen, we have some key dates. And um, again, these were all reviewed with your library leads. November 6th, 7th, and 8th, we hosted uh, two staff members from each library. In a lot of cases, these were the library leads and another key staff member who would be involved in training. Um, in other cases, it was the library lead did not attend, but uh, key training staff did. At these sessions, Deborah walked through a lot of the policy changes that we've talked about at technical group meetings and shared in our newsletter and on the portal, and talked about how to incorporate those into training. Attendees also got an overview of the different um, interfaces. So we looked at Leap, the client, and PowerPack. And we talked a lot about how to start building your training plan, because that training plan is due to CCS on December 1st. 
Um, and this is just for CCS to know how you're structuring your internal training um, and to ensure that it's going to fit in with before go live. So we want to make sure everyone has the training they need before the big day. So we've issued some other deadlines around that. On February 9th, we, or by February 9th, technical services staff should have completed their initial training. And that is because acquisitions and serials training begins um, on February 9th. So we don't want anyone to wander into an acquisitions training session and have them see the client for the first time. So technical services staff should be familiar with the staff client before we, we start with acquisitions and serials training. That will also give staff the opportunity and time to be building some local templates that they may want to be, use or modify centrally created templates to help prepare them for go live. The next deadline that we've indicated is March 1st, public services staff complete initial training. And we've, um, it has been noted that we are, CCS is continuing to host public services training through March. And that's why we have noted complete initial training here. Um, by the time we get to March, we're about six weeks away from go live. And by that point, everyone should have at least familiarity with the tools that we're going to be using. Because if you think back to my earlier slide about tr uh, one of the key elements of training is that it's ongoing. So for someone, so everyone should receive training at least six weeks before they're going to have to use this product every day at their at work. So they can use that intervening time to reinforce their skills and continue to build confidence. So this deadline does seem a little bit early since we're um, not going live until mid-April, but that March through April time is going to be crucial for review and reinforcement. Uh, Let's see, are there questions? I'm gonna take a, a pause for a minute here to see if there are questions in the chat about anything I've covered so far regarding training or questions about training that I did not cover that you may have. Uh, we have a question asking about two minute tutorials and if we'll do some of those on the staff client as well. Sure is my answer. Um, if you have requests for uh, or ideas for a two-minute tutorial, please feel free to submit those to us. Um, we are continuing to build that library, and if it would be helpful to have some on the staff client as well, which I think makes a lot of sense, we can add those into our schedule. Any additional questions on training? I will reiterate, um, I don't think I specifically mentioned it. We did go back through the Polaris-led training um, registrations to ensure that someone from each library will get training in cataloging and circulation before the end of the calendar year to ensure that they will have the knowledge they need to start planning in-house training. So your in-library training um, will really start to ramp up in January and kind of run through April. While you'll still be learning from CCS and Polaris during that time, you should have the confidence and skills at, at that point to start building your training agendas and maybe leading some initial sessions. And we do know that some libraries have already been doing ongoing training in their, in their meetings, and we've been happy to see that. There's no additional questions. I'm going to move on to data testing. One more pause. Okay. So a wise woman recently said, every ticket you open now is an emergency we avoid in April. And I want to reiterate that because we've heard some comments from library staff at all levels saying, we don't want to bother you with tickets. And I cannot say ardently enough that now is the time to send us tickets. Um, we have, finding errors is a, is a normal part of a migration. 
we've done a lot of mapping and profiling and we've implemented a lot of changes and that all contributes to the complexity of our project. Even with the simplest project, you would expect there to be mistakes. There's just a lot of records that we're dealing with. But when we add in 24 libraries and 24 sets of rules, that's a lot of opportunity for error. So um, please, please, please <laughs> send, us, uh, send us tickets. Um, we have several months that we can of time where we can spend uh, testing and resolving those issues. So the more time and energy that goes into data testing now, the smoother a transition we'll have in April. <laughs> uh, and also, isn't Deborah a good sport? I think so. And if you missed our migration kickoff party, this is the photo booth opportunity that you missed. All right, so um, data testing happens in a lot of different ways in sort of different formats. And I've identified three major ways that CCS is categorizing data testing. We have our formal data testing assignments, which are being emailed to library leads and data testing coordinators as they're created. We have personal exploration, which can happen in a lot of different ways. And then we have group training, which is primarily a learning experience, but also um, an opportunity to find and report errors. So I'm going to talk about each of these methods of data testing. Data testing assignments, we've identified five major areas, patron records, item records, bibliographic records, policies, and power pack. Each of these areas are sort of distinct and need some focused attention to ensure that all of our mapping and policies and functionality is set up the way we want it to be. Uh, Power Pack, we have recently determined, is a bigger job than we anticipated. So we are splitting that into two parts, with part one being released today and part two coming soon, um, probably within the next two weeks. And each of these data testing assignments has multiple components. So there's like a basic instruction email, and that email is going out to our data testing coordinators and library leads. And that gives some sort of high level watch outs and general instructions on what to test and uh, kind of how to divvy your time. We've been hearing questions like, how many records do I need to test? And the answer varies library to library because libraries have different setup and different complexity. So for example, a library that uses like 10 symphony item types is going to have many fewer or potentially fewer material types in Polaris to check. And we want to make sure when we're looking at our items that we're looking at a good chunk in each of our different kinds of categories. So for items, I want to look at things in a variety of material types, with a variety of loan periods, with a variety of hold permissions, and I want to make sure that I'm hitting, excuse me, hitting several records in each of those categories. And our instructions and our worksheets outline that for you. Um, which then brings up the question, well, is three enough? Is five enough? 25? How many of these should I look at? And the answer, again, is it varies. If you look at five or 10 records and they all look exactly how you would expect them to look, you can feel pretty confident and say, one, I understand how these records are structured and I understand where the data lives and I personally feel confident. And two, I feel I can represent to my library that, that there's no error in this chunk of records that are like these five or 10 that I checked. On the other hand, if you check a few records and you see some inconsistencies and have some questions, um, you'll probably want to check more records to see how widespread are those inconsistencies, what sort of patterns can I see when I'm looking at these records. So um, like a lot of answers, this one is it varies and it depends on local complexity, um, your individual sort of confidence in learning, and then the number of errors or if any errors were found in your initial pass through. And then we'll talk about error resolution but as errors are resolved, we're pushing back out 
and asking you to go back and look at those records that had mistakes and make sure those mistakes are gone. Again, to help with that, we have data testing worksheets. And these worksheets are step-by-step -step guides of what to look at on records. And these do not need to be submitted to CCS. They're really designed as a tool that you can use either personally to help you understand all these different elements of a record or internally. Um, each library will determine internal reporting uh, procedures and delegate data testing ta tasks as needed. So at your library, your data testing coordinator or library lead may say, I want each staff member in circulation to look at three records of each patron code. And I want them to fill out a sheet so I know that they looked at them. Um, an another library may say something similar, but say, I only want you to fill out a sheet if there was a mistake and an error that you need to report. Otherwise, just tell me how many records you looked at. Um, that's up to each individual library based on, you know, your individual staffing models and local culture. But those don't need to be submitted to CCS, but they are tools available for you to use. Additionally, um, the data testing coordinators and library leads should have received a link to an online uh, data testing tracker. So this is just a, a Google spreadsheet, and we can grant access to email addresses as needed. So, you know, we have your local library email addresses on file. If you have a different Gmail account or a different account linked to Gmail that you want to use, we can certainly update that. Or if you're at a library where um, your data testing coordinator and library lead have access but also want additional staff to be in that document, we can make that access as well. And these documents um, lay out each kind of record and then which values exist for your library. So they mirror your um, policy sheets, which are also available on the portal, and um, give you a good indication of sort of how complex your own setup is going to be. Any questions on that piece? We're still going to talk about data testing, but I feel like I rambled a little long on that slide. So outside of um, formal assignments, personal exploration and sort of what I call tooling around in the database is going to be an important element of both learning as well as data testing. Um, by getting in and clicking buttons and exploring functionality, um, you'll have the opportunity to find issues or raise questions. So there may be a, a functionality problem where we need to adjust some configuration, or you may, you know, assume that you understood how to uh, check out an item based on our two-minute tutorial, but then when you were actually practicing, found that you were running into roadblocks you didn't expect. So having the opportunity to ask those questions now, um, whether you're asking them internally to your colleagues or directly to CCS, um, your questions get answered, and then questions that come up regularly to CCS, we know that we need to incorporate that into training and documentation because, um, you know, it wasn't clearly addressed in whatever other learning was done. You can also, of course, uncover data issues. You all know your data better than CCS does. We have a very high-level picture of how the database works and how all these pieces fit together. But when it comes to thinking about how your library assigns loan periods, all I know is what's, what I see. Um, whereas you may say, well, yeah, but that doesn't really match what our local policy is, and then can do some additional investigating to see if that um, you know, is a, an odd exception or something that was done intentionally or if we need to make some changes to mapping or profiling. It can also be a great way, again, just to reinforce your training. At our Train the Trainer sessions, we had a library suggestion. Um, at one library, uh, they've recommended that public services staff keep LEAP open while they're working and after, um, after a task is completed in Symphony, 
do the same task in Leap and see how the workflow is the same or different. Um, if you're doing a search to place a hold for a patron, how are your search results different? Does it function the same way? And it's okay if it's different. What's important is that we understand what those differences are and how, what adjustments we may need to make uh, to accommodate the software. We've talked about that kind of a lot in, uh, as the project was sort of gearing up, was the discussion of being um, open to changing workflows. It's a lot easier to change our sort of human day-to-day, -day, what do I do and in what order tasks, than it is to rewrite software. Um, and that brings us to sort of this testing of workflows and considering exceptions that I'll talk about, but there is a, chat, a question in the chat that I wanna look at before I move on. So we have a question about um, automated performance testing. And in, in the question is, will there be automated performance testing for the database? Um, the question references historical issues with uh, resource sizing and wanting to ensure that we don't see those same issues again, which I uh, agree with. So we want to look at comparison to other clients' usage and resource allocation and automated testing compared to our expected usage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, as a hosted customer, have some uh, provisions in our contract about uh, performance testing and uh, resource allocation. So um, we can certainly provide some more information to that to the IT group uh, about what our setup and configuration is, what our contractual um, sort of rights are in terms of that kind of testing, and uh, do some comparisons to other sites of our size. So. Uh, that is a good question, and we can provide some more documentation and information on that. Another question is, is there a deadline to complete data testing? Uh, yes and no is the answer. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, I do want to talk about group training uh, because this I don't think it's intuitively thought of as a data testing uh, forum, I guess. But, but it is, as you're working with a group, whether it's here at CCS or back in your library, you're hearing questions from other staff and thinking about sort of procedures and exceptions and things that you may not encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. And having that sort of group mind, thinking of the sort of weird things that happen and testing them out is a great opportunity to find things that may need correction. It's also an important opportunity to test new workflows. So again, um, if how you run your pick list is gonna change, walking through what that procedure looks like at your library um, with the people who are gonna be doing that work can bring up um, potential hiccups that we can address now instead of scrambling um, in April to address them. So uh, our recommendation is to plan to have a note taker at each session at every training session we've had here at CCS, there have been um, questions either about functionality or data that we've wanted to follow up on. So we have, when Polaris is leading training, we always have a CCS staff member on hand to be hearing those questions and making those notes. And that's worked really well for us and it's something I would suggest for libraries to do as well. And then those can be, um, shared with CCS um, if needed, or if they can be managed internally, that can happen as well. And we'll talk about reporting issues. The question um, from the chat is, is there a deadline to complete the data testing? The sooner, the, like the more data testing that happens earlier in the project, the better. That gives CCS and Polaris more time to be resolving these issues. CCS has a deadline with Polaris. We have a final data sign-off that we have to do on March 30th. And at that point, we're telling Polaris, yep, the mapping is good, the profiling is good, we're not gonna open any more tickets before we go live. And it gives them a chance to sort of finalize all the scripts that they're using. So um, that is the, the hard and fast deadline for data testing. 
data testing should be happening on a continuous basis. Um, there have been a few things where uh, we've issued a specific deadline. We sent out some information um, focusing on our technical services friends on data cleanup uh, for potential mismatches between item cat three and item type and asked for that to be completed for the first time by today, um, October 15th, but that that's something um, that happens continuously on a monthly basis. Um, when we're looking at, at data testing, some of the issues are on like profiling and mapping and changes that we need to make. But some of the tickets that we see and some of the questions that you guys will uncover will actually indicate um, a cleanup project in Symphony. So uh, we can only map things that exist, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, we've set, we'll stick with item, item cat three and material and item type as um, one of the ways that we map to material type, the primary way. If um, between, let, so let's say a library did great and they, they did their data cleanup and today in their database they have no um, items with an item cat three, which is format, that does not match the item type. So they don't have anything that they have flagged as both um, item cat three format of book, but a, a symphony item type of pamphlet or something. Um, that's great today, but as items are added in, that work needs to continue. Um, we have a question about that report. Isn't that item cat three mismatch site always changing based on the items entered into Cersei? Um, I believe that answer is, is yes, that it's sort of a, a dynamic report that when you pull it up, it queries the database. But I'm going to check with Bob on that. Um, oh, and I already have an answer from CCS staff. It's updated daily. So um, that specific data cleanup tool that I was referencing is updated daily. Thanks. So there's no firm deadline. The deadline is all the time. We'll talk more about um, the last day to sort of report issues, but the reality is that we'll continue to find issues um, into March and past go live, and we'll obviously still be working with everyone to correct those. But again, if we go back to um, you know Deborah's comment that everything we find today and fix now is something that's not going to be an emergency in April. We have the luxury of time now where we're not impacting patrons. So um, the, the more the better at this point. So we've talked a lot about different sort of areas of your work where you'll find issues. What do you do when you find them? What is the process for reporting and resolving issues? The first step will vary by library. You may have, your library may have a process in place and your library leader, data testing coordinator can tell you what it is um, to report things internally. It may be that issues go through an internal vetting process before they're escalated to CCS. It may also be that your library says, we have these people doing data testing and they should report tickets directly to CCS. Either way is fine with us. At some point, a ticket is opened with CCS, and then we evaluate um, the issue. Uh, we'll often or always replicate it. So you may send us some screenshots. We're going to go pull up those same records and look at those same screenshots. Or you may give us sort of a narrative of, I hit, I hit this button, and I expected X to happen, but instead Y happened. We're going to go press those same buttons and make sure that we're getting the same behavior. So that helps us understand um, one, what your issue is, and then two, um, we may be able to resolve it. Maybe it's a training issue or a piece of uh, a setting that we can change on our end. So we can reply and resolve that issue directly with our library staff. Um, and, then, and then that issue is corrected. If we can't resolve it, then we will escalate it to Polaris. 
So that's when we add it to our sort of Polaris issues log and maybe Jerry, our, our data guy, has to make some adjustments to his script or we need Mary, our implementation manager, to help us change some settings that maybe we don't have access to. And I want to give you a sense of um, what, how many and what kind of issues have been coming in. So since the start of our project, so let's say September, because we got access to our database um, kind of a week and a half into September, we've had over 290 tickets opened by library staff that had Polaris set as a category. Um, so that's, that's a lot. Um, you guys have been doing great and finding a lot of issues. Of those 290, um, when I was putting these numbers together yesterday, 198 of them have been resolved. So that could have been a data issue that has been corrected or a knowledge issue where we were able to provide more information. Um, so that's where we are with that. And then of those 290 Polaris tickets, as well as the work that CCS staff have been doing internally, sort of outside our ticket system, uh, 90 of those issues, as of yesterday, have escalated to Polaris on our known issues log. Um, we have sort of two versions of our known issues log. We have the CCS version, which has all the issues on it um, that affect everyone from uh, one specific library and a tiny subset of their records to issues that affect the whole consortium. So that when, that's our issues log. We also have a log available on our migration portal, which is a subset of those, those issues that affect all or, all or many libraries. So, you know, it may not matter, it may not matter to um, Lake Forest that uh, Niles identified a shelf location mapping error. So we're not going to clutter our migration portal with those library specific issues. Um, so if you don't see your issue on that known issues port on the migration portal, that does not mean that your issue has not been sent to Polaris. So of those 90 issues escalated to Polaris, as of yesterday, 38 have been resolved and we're working um, every day to resolve more of those. The kinds of things that we see in tickets include um, mapping and profiling corrections. So things like uh, this USB drive was flagged as an audiobook. That's not correct and let's go ahead and fix that. Um, data load anomalies, this was a big one. Um, the fact that our, our diacritics were not displaying properly um, was a big data load issue that wasn't really due to a mapping or profiling problem. And then we see some change requests. So, um, you know, originally we submitted that our audiobooks check out for 14 days, but really this set also checks out for 21 days. Can we make sure that that's accounted for? And we just see a lot of functionality questions, not being sure how the software works, like this is what I saw, is this normal? All of those questions, keep them coming. Uh, I also got an update from CCS staff that 11 Polaris tickets were submitted to, so far today, so now we've hit our 300 mark, uh, exceeded our 300 mark, so keep them coming, everyone. Um, what we don't want is for you to feel like when you submit a ticket, it just sort of goes to our ticket system to die. That is not a thing that I want. So. Um, I want to make sure that library staff are aware of, one, that known issues log where they can see sort of system-wide issues that are both open and resolved, as well as um, just sort of the pace that we're working on. And as we're resolving, to that end, as we're resolving issues, um, we're updating the known issues log on the migration portal. We're sharing highlights in the migration newsletter. And again, these are sort of high-level things that we're sharing to say, okay, stat codes weren't uh, mapped originally and not loaded, but now we've loaded patron stat codes, so please go ahead and review. So something like that as opposed to um, this one library's specific code wasn't mapped. So the newsletter is for everyone or most libraries. And then for individual issues, those fresh desk tickets are being updated. Um, so I, I think one of our first data testing uh, tickets that came in had several issues in it, which was amazing, uh, and took, I think, close to two months to resolve. And it's because we were addressing maybe 11 different questions in one email or in one ticket. So uh, tickets may be open longer 
than usual, but progress is being made and you should be getting updates. And if you have any questions, you can always kind of bump your ticket and uh, see if there is anything you should be testing on your end. Because once an issue is resolved, um, whether it's shared in the migration portal or answered in your fresh desk ticket, um, you can go ahead and go back and recheck those records to make sure, yep, they under like CCS understood my question, Polaris understood my question, and now my issue is fully resolved. Any questions um, on data testing, reporting issues, how to tell if an issue is resolved? We have a question. Um, Will corrections be made to the test server or will the errors be with us until April? Corrections are being made to the existing data, so in, in most cases. So, um, for example, one issue, for example, was that gender data was, that was collected in PatronCat 1 um, was supposed to migrate to the gender field in a patron record um, and didn't initially. So. Uh, we worked with Polaris and that change was made both in Jerry's scripts that he's going to run when we do our final load, but then also the, the test data was updated. So if we report back to you and say, yep, that issue is resolved, um, unless we say otherwise, the test data in our test database should reflect that. And CCS is vetting those and confirming before we, we tell you, but if you find something we missed, we absolutely want to know. The big exception at this point is our diacritics issue. So um, for those of you who, who aren't sure, the diacritics are special characters, um, whether that's uh, accent marks over certain letters or uh, the copyright symbol or other special characters did not load properly and are not displaying correctly in any of the interfaces. So PowerPack, Leap, and the staff client. Polaris identified the issue, which was actually in the the data extract um, and was able to successfully load the bib records again on our production server. So not, not on the test server that you have access to, but the server that will be production. Um, so CCS staff were able to vet and say, yes, those are corrected. We are currently talking with Polaris about um, what our options are for getting all or some records fixed on production or on test, pardon me, on Polaris test, so all of you can see that as well. But for the most part, issues that are corrected are corrected with our, our live test data. And I have another question in chat, and we did also have a, a helpful comment in the chat that um, questions that have been asked in the chat, if we could answer and post post those Q&A um, as well. So we can do that when we do our summary and post the webinar recording. So we'll get these answers. Um, so two questions. The first one is, there are records we see in Circe that we shouldn't see on the Polaris test server. The data loaded into Polaris test server, was it based on date created for bib record? That's a, another great question and a good clarification. And I apologize for not bringing that up sooner. The data that was extracted from Symphony, the data was extracted once. It was extracted at the end of July. So the data that's in Polaris now is a snapshot of our database as it existed at the end of July of this year. So records that were added after July, whether it's a patron record, item record, bib record, those are not going to be in Polaris test, and that's not an error, that's just it's not a dynamic connection. We just took the data out of Symphony on one day, popped it into Polaris. Um, so in order to help you sort of mitigate that, and so you don't have to look at a, a record in Symphony and say, well, this has all sorts of fields that aren't in Polaris, the Symphony test server is available. And the Symphony test server um, is that same snapshot or within a couple of days of the Polaris data. So you don't have to say, oh, this bib isn't in Polaris, but let me go check the created day and see um, you know, how new this record is. You can just log directly into Symphony Test, and whatever's in Symphony Test should be in Polaris Test and vice versa. 
although as we're um, doing some testing and training, new records are being added into Polaris. So there will be some things in Polaris that aren't in Symfony. Um, instructions on how to access Symfony test are available on the migration portal as well. Another question is, are notes and comments fields and workflows migrated to Polaris? That was one of our issues, that the notes and comments didn't initially get mapped over. I believe that issue is resolved um, for both items and patrons, but I uh, could be wrong on that. Uh, if you are coming across records that should have notes or comments that do not, you can go ahead and open a ticket. Um, and we'll take a look at those. But the notes and comments are part of the migrated data. And uh, yes, comments should, uh, I got an update from Deborah. Comments should all be there now, notes and comments. Please open a ticket if you're finding records where that is not true. Uh, and then we have another question about patron communication, and I'm going to flag that to talk about um, in a little bit. So Anastasia, I see your question, and I'll make sure to address it. Any additional questions on data testing, reporting issues? OK, I'm going to move on. We're going to talk about additional configuration work that's happening. And then we're going to look ahead. And Anastasia, in that look ahead, that's where I'm going to answer your question. So a big component that we're working on right now, in addition to data testing and training, is additional configuration. And I say additional because like the setting up of the server and the profiling and then mapping, that's all configuration. But that's not everything. We have a lot of third-party integration work that needs to happen centrally and or at libraries. Um, and I want to talk through four major components of that now. So we'll talk about SIP connected tools. And I'll give examples of what those are. We'll talk about um, printers and peripherals, uh, e-content, and Collection HQ. So um, SIP is a, a communication standard. It's a way that um, our database can communicate with something that's not our database. And I've sort of divided those kinds of connections into two different categories. We have stuff that, that talks to our database just to authenticate that a patron is a real patron and that they're in good standing. So you know, your print management system that, or computer management um, that says, yeah, they're a patron. They can get on the internet. Here's their guest pass and lets them log in um, would be an example. Or a database that checks against the database to ensure that a patron is Act, or a patron's in good standing as opposed to one that, um, and checks maybe that their password is correct as opposed to something that looks at like a barcode pattern. Um, Overdrive, for example, can authenticate through SIP. We also have other tools that have a SIP connection, but they do more stuff. So I'm saying that they're tools that interact. So our, um, our automatic materials handlers, AMHs or sorters, all kind of the same, uh, different terms for the same tool, self-checks, and then um, tools like Boopsy or Communico are uh, connect, or at least can connect through SIP or are otherwise need to be integrated. So we have these two different categories, so we have some different processes. So for the authentication tools, um, CCS will contact each vendor by the end of the calendar year to determine or to discuss what their switchover process is and um, what information they need from us and what we need from them. And wherever possible, CCS will work directly with them on behalf of all of the li uh, excuse me, on behalf of all of the libraries that use them to do the reconfiguration and to schedule. So um, you know, if we have 24 libraries that all have Gale databases, um, what I would like to avoid is all 24 of you having to take action, and like have support tickets open and work with Gale. Um, I say wherever possible because if a vendor says, you know what, we need to talk directly with our client, like we don't know you, we may have to push back to libraries or get some other permissioning in place, but we'll be working on that. So we want to do um, that initial communication by the end of this calendar year and then get um, get their, their team kind of updated on what we're doing and get the switchover scheduled. 
And I save a switch over because uh, basically what we need to do is when we're live on the new system, say, hey, EBSCO, stop authenticating against Symfony. That data is no longer active and, or accurate and start authenticating against Polaris and make sure that it can communicate the way it needs to. There's a lot of those tools. So we've divvied them up internally and we'll be reaching out to those vendors. We'll also share our list with everyone to make sure that we're covering all our bases and that there haven't been any other tools added um, that we need to address. The tools that interact are different and have a lot of different um, functions and, and for that the process will have to vary by tool. Um, and in general, CUCS will be reaching out to libraries to talk about configuration and testing. Because we do also want to make sure that you feel comfortable that your self-check is going to work um, when we go live and that you're not going in blind in April saying, gosh, I hope this works as we press some big red button. So we want to make sure that we have the opportunity um, to configure and test things as needed. Um, one area that we've been talking about already is our material sorters. So um, as a lot of you probably know, um, as things go down a conveyor belt and get dropped into a bin, there's instructions about which materials go in which bins, and those are based on policies, um, you know, shelf locations, uh, material types, et cetera, that are changing. So those will all have to be sort of reconfigured. Um, so CCS will be hosting a materials handler meeting for those libraries that have sorters and want to get together and talk with colleagues and talk through some potential configuration hurdles with CCS staff. Um, so that we actually just scheduled, this is our first announcement, um, for February 2nd. So watch for more information about that and think about if, if your library has a sorter, if you'd want to attend or, or who the right person from your library would be. But in general, for these additional tools, we'll be contacting libraries um, to, to see how we can help facilitate that testing. For example, we've already reached out to Boopsy to say, hey, we're migrating. What do you guys need from us? And we'll be doing that with other vendors as well. Printers is another area that will need some attention. So we have um, sort of your traditional like laser jet printers, right, just printing on paper. We also have label printers and receipt printers. And all of those will need some, some level of configuration um, in the staff client and or in LEAP. So basic configuration documentation is currently available on the migration portal. And that's really sort of like step one is where um, for the client, we have to install this tool called screwdrivers. And there's instructions on how to do that. It's free and available for or included with our bundle. And then for LEAP, um, you'll be printing from your browser. To help facilitate some of this, CCS will be collecting receipt and label printer model information. We just need to make sure that they're all named in our software, so we'll be reaching out to you about those. Um, and then we have additional documentation that Bob has already drafted, and we are just um, finalizing, like reviewing and finalizing internally. And that will cover things like spine label setup in the staff client, configuring receipts and slips and leap. Um, and then there's some good references to the Polaris help files, which also provide detailed information on printing. So we'll be asking you um, in the next week or so for your receipt and label printer model information, and then um, pushing this additional documentation out as well. I have another question about um, a third-party integration. Will the third-party vendor such as ePay be contacted by CCS and work with Polaris. Um, E-commerce is sort of a separate beast or credit card processing. Um, so CCS will be making a recommendation to governing board about which of two integrated vendors, um, Envisionware or Comprise, that um, CCS should move forward with for patrons to make payments through PowerPack. Um, so that is like an integration that will work with Polaris, and there's two vendors for that. Those same two vendors can provide services regarding point of sale, self-check, um, credit card processing, so sort of like non-internet-based credit card processing, sometimes called card present transactions. I don't, um, 
those are the only two vendors that are integrated with the Polaris system um, and would need configuration work. Um, e libraries that use ePay can continue to use ePay for credit card transactions, but will need to manually um, update. Like, for example, if you accept a credit card and process a transaction through ePay now, you're probably then um, manually updating that user's record to say, I received a payment for this bill. That pro excuse me, one minute. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry, I just coughed in all of your ears. Um, that process of manually updating the bill, if you want to continue to use ePay, e will continue. So um, that's something to consider as well. Um, other, other peripherals, um, such as barcode readers, are pretty much just plug and play. So if you've come to our training, you may have used one of our barcode readers, which to configure, we plugged into the computer. So um, you can go ahead and be testing those, um, those features now. RFID pads may be, um, we may need to flip a setting for RFID pads. Um, so those might not be entirely plug and play, but we're researching that and we'll let you know. Um, so watch for that information as well. And I have another chat question that says, is Polaris looking at any other vendors for point of sale integration? Not to my knowledge, um, all, not to my knowledge is the short answer. Um, it's possible that if another vendor approached them or a customer approached them and wanted integration, they would work on it. Um, but it's, not on the horizon that I know of. So um, other integrations that are in the works, so e-commerce, good questions. Um, E-content, so like with enterprise, in our current public catalog, records from specific e-content providers are automatically imported into the public catalog and are available to download direct, a direct download from the catalog for logged in patrons. Polaris has a similar tool, although instead of importing only into the public catalog, it imp the public catalog and, and the staff tools share a database. So they're in the staff database as well. So there's an automated import process that needs to be configured for those vendors. And we're working with our implementation manager on that process. And then the second piece of that is that uh, we need to determine our procedure for using our MARC records. So, um, you know, we'll get those sort of vendor records that come in from the vendors for that automated process. And then what can we do with the robust MARC records that are, we're currently getting from OverDrive, um, like to overlay them or use that data. So that's a process that we're um, discussing and working on at this time. We're also working for our Collection HQ libraries to send the test extract to Collection HQ for their initial analysis, and then they will provide some mapping data out to, um, to help reconfigure and re-implement your Collection HQ setups. So that's in the works as well. And CCS will support libraries um, and sort of facilitate those conversations between um, Collection HQ and the libraries, since some of them may be uh, more database related as you're still learning your, your new data configuration. Additional questions on, uh, on configuration work? We'll move on to looking ahead. So uh, we still have several months before go live, and they're going to be several busy months. So in November, we're going to continue doing what we're doing, basically. So we've got data testing, additional configuration work that we're working on, and um, Polaris-led training is continuing. In December, we're going to, and I see a question. I'll circle back to you in a minute. Um, in December, we're going to continue doing our data testing because we're not going to stop until they make us. Uh, continue data testing, continue our additional configuration work, 
training plans for in-library training are going to be due on December 1st, and that will indicate when your staff are going to be getting their internal training. And then we have what I'm referring to in later months as training, training, training. So we have Polaris-led training, CCS-led training, and by December, it's possible that your library may start some in-house training if you haven't already. So in our future months, I'm shorthanding Polaris-led, CCS-led, and in-house training as training, training, training. So in January, we have more of the same data testing, configuration, training, training, training. And in January is when I would recommend that we start patron communication. So we had a question earlier in the chat, is CCS going to provide anything for libraries to use in communicating with their patrons? And the answer is yes. Um, we'll be working on that internally um, and reaching out to library staff for some assistance on that as, um, over the next couple of months and then would recommend uh, uh, introducing these topics to your to your patrons in January with a focus on your patron communication really not until um, March you're and again that's a, a suggestion um, your library may have a, another plan already in place or you know your communities better than we do um, from our point of view if we start too early it sort of just becomes noise that patrons ignore instead of um, kind of pay attention to. So um, we're not really looking at patron communication until 20, in pushing information out about patron communication until 2018. Um, but we will be looking to uh, provide some central uh, communication to patrons um, or th things that you can sort of modify to meet your needs. Uh, and then in February, we have more data testing, more configuration uh, and testing of that configuration, training, training, training. Our next webinar where we'll be doing um, updates on all of these things, outstanding issues that we may need to address, maybe uh, more functionality related questions as more people have received training. So that will come in February, a uh, roundup of the configuration that's done, any outstanding issues we need to do. Um, and then we move into like March and April, which are going to be uh, big months. So March, training, training, training. We finish up our data testing and do that data sign off on March 30th with Polaris. We finish up any additional um, configuration or testing. And now is when, again, we focus on that patron communication. We have two um, events that we still want to schedule for March. One is an offline practice day. So um, as part of Go Live, we'll be using the Polaris offline tool um, because we will be offline for um, a to-be-determined number of days. We're currently working on that with Polaris. Um, so we want people to be familiar with this tool before the day they have to use it. So while we are covering some of that information in training, and we'll certainly put together some very detailed documentation with screenshots and videos, we want to have a practice day. So that will help us understand um, or help everyone understand how to actually do that work um, when it comes to using offline for those few days and then help CCS say like, okay, now I, like, I can see where those files are and how I need to upload them and help us get that real world experience as well. So I will say that we will have Polaris staff on site to do that for us during Go Live. A little practice never hurt anyone. We'll also have another webinar in March, and that'll be our Go Live Prep webinar. So that'll be after our offline practice day, and we'll walk through um, all of the Go Live details that we need to talk about. Um, what sort of downtime we'll be looking at, remind, and this will be shared before then, but it will be our chance to kind of go through it together step by step. Um, what kind of downtime we're looking at, uh, what's allowed during that time and what's not, what to expect on the day of Go Live, what sort of communication you can expect from CCS during that time. We don't want you to feel like we're in a black box. Uh, we'll be sending out some regular updates and we'll be able to talk to you in March about what those look like and how to monitor them. And then at the end of the month, we have our data sign off. And then on to April, which is the big month, we'll have um, some additional training opportunities. I hope you're continuing your training in-house. Again, by this time, all of your staff will have gotten some training, but should be doing that review and reinforcement in March and April. Um, additional communication. Last 
sort of go live prep and then uh, mid-April it will be time. So we're looking at uh, that week of, of April 15th and we're just finishing finalizing our go live schedule with Polaris um, and talking about uh, making sure that we're minimizing downtime and also creating realistic expectations. So we are um, continuing that conversation with them and we'll have information for you soon. Uh, so that's a very broad looking ahead view and then we have time for questions about anything we covered today or things that we didn't cover that you want to make sure are covered either today or in future. Um, we have a question about Gale Analytics on demand. Um, we can certainly, uh, will we be helping with configuration on that? We can certainly help if you want to open a ticket. Um, Collection HQ we're sort of in the weeds with since billing goes through us, but um, let us know what you're looking for with Gale um, or how we can help and, and we can certainly do it and or add it to our list of vendors to work with if it's not already on there. Additional questions about anything. I do want to go ahead and put your questions in if you've got them on the portal. I talked a lot about resources that are on the portal today and I want to make sure that um, you know where they are. So I'm already logged in. A reminder, this is our shared login of CCSLib24 at ccslib.org. Um, under data testing, we have sort of a broad introduction to data testing. We have assignments that are posted here. Um, we have one more that we need, two more that we need to post here. Um, access information for Symfony Test Server, our test database known issues, which we talked a lot about today. So um, it defaults to show you the open issues first. So these are the things that we're still working on or need to confirm if they've been resolved. And then at the bottom, you can see resolved issues as well. So, um, you know, ILL functionality was not available in Leap. It is now. If you're still not seeing that, um, you can take a look at that. Um, so that's your data testing information. And then training schedule information is here under training. And then training materials are a separate heading. So if you look at, for example, public services, you can see um, we've got the PowerPoints embedded or you can click um, to push through to the slides and you can download them and use them or refer to them here as needed and then um, recorded demos and uh, sample CCS training agendas, Polaris agendas sort of summarized as well as access to the full agendas. And we have our link to our two-minute tutorials and our webinar recordings. So that information is all here. I know I walked through it quickly with the slides. I see some questions in the chat. Um, It looks like Tori and CC, other CCS staff are talking about some OCLC numbers. I'm going to address a question that came in privately. Uh, power pack profiles that individual libraries can make like we have for enterprise. When will that be starting? That is a great question also. Um, our PASS group is meeting tomorrow because today is Wednesday. So our PASS advisory group is meeting tomorrow and we'll be reviewing with that group a list of um, potential customizations to be talking about what is in-house or, or like customized by library versus custom or central to CCS. Sorry, that was not very clear. So like when we went live with Enterprise, um, there was a committee that made some recommendations on which features everyone would have the same for sort of uniformity across libraries and which features would be different by libraries. We'll be having that conversation again. And then there are some functionality differences with Polaris in terms of what 
can be done locally versus centrally, and we're working on documentation to help libraries understand that. Um, the other question we have, can we assign OCLC number to be the temp number for ILL? Um, it sounds to me like CCS staff are discussing that uh, in the other room. I do not know the answer to that, so we may need to get back to you on that, Tori, or follow up separately. Additional questions? Great, we will follow up. Thanks, Tori. Um, I can stick around for a minute if anyone has any additional questions. Otherwise, I want to thank everyone for their time today. Again, we'll um, process this recording and get it up on our, on our migration portal, as well as um, was excellently suggested a list of the questions that, we, um, that were asked and answered during this session to go with that summary. So thank you, everyone. Um, Please continue to do your data testing. You've done a phenomenal job already of getting those tickets in, uh, and we will keep working through them and working to resolve them. So thank you so much for your time today and continued work on this project. Seeing no more questions, I'm going to stop the recording. All right.